There's a story that has made its way around the internet over the years, and it goes something like this. Jesus and Satan were having an ongoing argument about who was better on the computer. <laughs> they had been going at it for days, and frankly, God was kind of tired of all the bickering. So finally fed up, God says, that's it, I have had enough. I am going to set up a test that will run for two hours, and from those results, I will judge who does the better job. So Satan and Jesus sat down at their keyboards, and they got to work. They moused. They emailed. They emailed with attachments. They updated Facebook profiles. They downloaded. They uploaded. They did spreadsheets. They wrote reports. They created labels and cards and charts and graphs. They did genealogy reports. They paid their bills. They even memed. They did every known job on the computer that was known to creation. Jesus worked with heavenly efficiency, and Satan was faster than hell. <laughs> I know, I know, it's getting better and better, right? <laughs> then, <laughs> then, with only ten minutes to go, lightning suddenly flashed across the sky. The thunder rolled. The rain poured down, and of course, the power went out. <laughs> Satan stared at his blank scream and cursed. Jesus, Jesus just sighed. Finally, the electricity came back on. Each of them restarted their computer, computers, and Satan started searching frantically. It's gone! It's all gone! I lost everything when the power went out. Meanwhile, Jesus quietly started printing out all of his files from the past two hours of labor. Wait, Satan protested. That's not fair. He cheated. How come he has all this work and I don't have any? God just shrugs and says, Jesus saves. Uh, yeah. good, good times. Yep. Okay, so I know this is absolutely terrible. Jesus save us all from the pastor's silly sermon leads. But this fun little story brings us to our Jesus saves text for this morning. We read that a member of the Sanhedrin named Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night and seeks out information. Nicodemus has heard Jesus speak before. Something has hooked him, but he still wants to know more. In what is among the richest and most complex of theological teachings in all the scriptures, Jesus responds by talking about being born from above. Jesus engages in some fun Greek wordplay here, actually, to talk about being born from above, because the word is the same as being born again in the Greek. And Nicodemus misunderstands this, and things take off from there, with Jesus speaking about a spiritual rebirth, and Nicodemus misunderstanding Jesus and talking about a physical one. How can someone be born again? So I want to take a quick poll with you all. When you hear the phrase born again, does that conjure up a positive image for you, a negative one, or something neutral? So let's do a show of thumbs. Thumbs up if you're good with the idea Jesus saves. Okay, I'm seeing some thumbs, very good. If you're neutral on this, do one of these. Okay, some neutral. If this is just bringing up all kinds of bad mojo for you, down thumbs. <laughs> Oh, wow. All right. Good to know. This is good. So for some of us, the phrase born again is pretty benign. And for some, it is welcome as we think of Jesus as one who saves. For others, it can conjure up images of forced testimonies or conversations about being saved that don't feel authentic to our experience of Christianity. And some people find themselves kind of in the middle. For Nicodemus, this whole idea of being born again is just plain confusing. His confusion is interesting because the text gives us every reason to believe that Nicodemus was actually a pretty sharp guy. He's a Pharisee and he's a member of the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish governing body. So he would have been as well educated as was possible, possible for any Jewish person at that time. So we're talking about asking questions in Lent, right? About listening to deep stories if anyone has the corner on this market, it is Nicodemus. He seeks Jesus out for this purpose. He wants to know more. This is us Googling until two o'clock in the morning to figure out some answer to something we're worried about. 
And he approaches Jesus at night, effectively saying, help me understand this. He is in the dark, literally, because it's nighttime. He approaches Jesus under cover of night, and he's in the dark in terms of understanding what Jesus is talking about. He causes Jesus to lose his patience with this scholar student turned potential follower. We've seen this before from Jesus. We could name a few occasions in which we see Peter, for example, speaking before thinking, and several times Jesus responds to the crowds, do you still not understand? So in these stories, it can be easy to relate a little bit, probably, to Jesus' frustration. He's having to repeat himself over and over before someone gets it. I find great comfort in this passage as a parent, having to remind my children 20 times a day to get ready for school. We do this every day. Do you still not understand? And this is the question Jesus asked Nicodemus. Do you still not understand? And it comes home to roost when my child is the one persistently trying to tell me something and I'm on my phone distracted and I realize I have not been paying attention. I am the one who misses the message. So who are we in this story? If I'm honest with myself, I'm probably more often in the role of the confused Nicodemus, not understanding, than I am in the one who gets it all the time, the all-knowing teacher, Jesus. Nicodemus is interesting. He's smart, he's well-educated, he's a leader and a teacher, he's well-respected in society. He approaches Jesus very respectfully. He uses the title rabbi, believing Jesus' teachings and actions come from God. He wants to know more. He's hungry. He's a spiritually hungry person. One of the invitations I often say at the table is this table is for all who are spiritually hungry. So Nicodemus is taking Jesus up on this and approaching him. Jesus does not have the same patience. Nicodemus finishes up the passage with a question. How can these things be? It's interesting that Nicodemus does not buy into what Jesus is saying. How can these things be? What does being born again actually mean? Jesus, what the heck are you talking about? What would it take for all of us to approach the scriptures with that question? How can these things be? I think it's a really honest question. Nicodemus, as I said, comes to Jesus at night and in private. He's not yet ready to show his faith in the daylight. And this is a difference. This is where we get to see a little more of Nicodemus' character. A difference from him and perhaps from us. He's not yet ready to show his faith and his openness. I'm inclined to think that the issue with Nicodemus is not one of intelligence. He's a smart guy. It's not one of education. He's an educated person. It's not one of sincerity. He seems to be genuine. And it's not even one of faith. We have no reason to believe that Nicodemus just doesn't believe. He's really curious. It's just that all of these things, his intellect, his faith, his sincerity, they stay in the dark. Whether it's too dangerous for him to do so, given his political situation, or whether his head and heart are not quite ready, Nicodemus does not let his faith in Jesus be public and open, visible to all in the light of day, which makes it a compartmentalized belief system of sorts. His faith has yet to affect the whole of his life. He approaches Jesus under cover of night. This is Nick at Night. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm rolling them all out today for y'all. Okay. Um, no, but in a way, this is interesting. Nick at Night became known, right, as this comforting time where we could come at night and go back to the comfort of reruns, not looking forward to new shows and new possibilities. Anyway, okay, I digress, but I think there's something there. Nicodemus's limitations in understanding what Jesus is trying to tell him are not because he doesn't get it. It's that he has not yet lived it. This is the example of love. We can know about love. We can study up on love. We can Google. We can do all the spreadsheets on love. We can sign up for all the 
the other dating apps and all this good stuff. We can do all of the work, but if we don't save it into our spirit such that we live it out, we're not going to understand love. Until we really live it, until we act upon it, until we work to let it affect all of our being and all of our actions, love is not fully understood. It would be like tapping away on a computer for two hours and then closing a file without thought to saving it. There are some who experience church like this. Some who come and say, okay, that was interesting, but then close that file in their hearts and never allow it to get them to the point of actually having a hard, real-life impact. Living out faith is really hard sometimes. It means allowing our understanding of God's love to impact how we spend our time, how we interact with others, how we spend our money, how we go through our day-to-day -day lives, what we choose to engage with, what we don't. It affects everything. It's a literal rebirth. It's a rebirth of one's spirit. This is what Jesus meant by being born from above, the same in Greek as born again. We are literally being reborn. How can these things be shows that Nicodemus is still trying to figure it out up here and doesn't yet grasp that being born of the spirit means a living out of one's faith that can go beyond the head and can infiltrate our whole beings. Only that kind of faith can cause a rebirth to take place, the kind that Jesus is talking about, the kind that has the power to change us from the inside out. So, beloved of God, what does it mean for you to hear the words born again? If that is a good phrase for you, hang on to it. If it's a benign or less than delightful phrase for you, I invite you to consider this question instead. What new birth does God wish to make come alive within you and within this community and within our church? We are uh, approaching spring, we hope, we pray, although we had snow finally, so really who knows. But there is new birth in this season. There's actually a reason Easter happens around the start of spring. That's intentional. There is new birth, new possibility, new life that can happen in an instance, a flash of inspiration. We all have a day in which we were born, which is a day set aside every year, hopefully, to somehow celebrate our existence in this world. And our birth certificates even name the precise hour and minute of our birth, if we are lucky and have been in a place that carefully categorizes such things. But our birthing process was, I would guess, longer than one minute, to which anyone who has been through labor pains can testify. Like birth, a rebirth takes time. It can be quite difficult. Growth of a human is difficult. Growth of a soul can take even longer than that. And healthy growth of a church community even longer still. This is the work to which we are called, to be open to new birth and to bear witness to it as it occurs. So I would like to take a few minutes, turn to someone near you, and I would like you to name somewhere you see new life at this time of year. It could be spring, outside, seeing something in nature. It could be a new thing that's coming into your life. It could be a new realization for you, something that's coming in here. Where do you see new life? And we're going to take just one minute for each person to share that, and I'll let you know when to switch, switch partners. I'll keep an eye on the clock. So where do you see new life right now in your life? Ways that I hope they have on All right. Feel free to come on back. So, new life. How many people, again, we'll do show of hands. How many people found this a pretty easy, you know, you landed on something quickly? Okay, we've got a good number. How many people found this a little more difficult? A little challenging to find something? Okay. 
This is all understandable. This is part of, of the journey. But this is the work to which we are called, to bear witness to the new life that God chooses to bring into our awareness. So we start out like Nicodemus in this passage, approaching God with our questions and our wonderings. Hopefully we are indeed as spiritually hungry as Nicodemus. But we don't stop there. And actually Nicodemus' story doesn't stop there either. We see our friend in two other passages in the book of John, and both of them provide hints that he is moving from intellectual understanding over to a rebirth. A few chapters later in the scriptures, Nicodemus reveals a bolder side to his character. The Sanhedrin see fit to condemn Jesus without a trial solely on the basis that he comes from the God-forsaken, of course, backwater region of Galilee, heaven forbid. And Nicodemus encourages them to listen to Jesus first and to grant him a fair hearing. This would have been a really brave move for him, certainly no longer in the dark, but very much in the light of day and enlightened in his understanding. He gets that Jesus has something that is worth listening to. And then, the second time, the last time we see Nicodemus, this is a great story. After the crucifixion, Joseph of Arimathea uh, requests Jesus' body. Pilate hands it over to him for, for burial. And Nicodemus shows up with the embalming spice myrrh and various aloes. In today's measurement, Nicodemus shows up with 75 pounds worth of myrrh and other things that they would use to tend to a dead body. Okay, 75 pounds of spices. Has anyone bought 75 pounds <laughs> of spices recently? This is absurd. It's a ridiculous amount, very expensive, and very extravagant. The point is that this is an extravagant show of faith that Nicodemus again does in the light of day. That amount would have been reserved for royalty at the time. Nicodemus sees Jesus in this way and tends to his body in the most reverent way possible. And the astounding part, of course, is what God does then, and it is so ironic and beautiful. Nicodemus prepares Jesus' body for nothing less than a rebirth. The rebirth. The bumbling student has become brave actor in this story. And by doing that, he plays a role in the resurrection itself, and then the birth of the entire Christian church by extension. This is the man who started out coming to Jesus quietly in the dead of night with a question, how can these things be, without understanding at all? And then he moves forward and ever forward and ever forward in faith in integrating that faith into who he is and then what he does. God answers Nicodemus' question in the most beautiful way then. How can these things be? Nicodemus, you're going to bring it out. <laughs> you're going to be the answer to your own question. So beloved of God, what is God wishing to do through you? What is God wishing to make come alive by your participation. What rebirth is slowly being formed within you? An idea that you have, questions that you hold, just waiting for you to be ready to take a step forward in faith. The God who provides space for questions may just be wanting to answer them in you. In the name of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.